Last time, we looked more deeply into the culpability required to establish accessorial liability. We aren't done with that. Let's take a detour first to the Red Hook housing project, the scene of the homicide at issue in People versus Russell. The victim was a school principal who was fatally struck by a stray bullet fired in a gunfight between the three defendants. The prosecution cannot prove who fired the fatal shot. This means that none of the three defendants can be convicted on the theory that he was the absolute perpetrator. Does this remind you of the tort case, Summers v. Tice? In that case, both defendants had fired negligently, but it could not be determined, even by a preponderance of the evidence, whose bullet had struck and caused the plaintiff's injury. Rather than deny the plaintiff any recovery, the court shifted the burden of persuasion on the issue of causation to the two defendants. Both would be liable unless they could show it was the other's bullet. That kind of ad hoc solution is not available in a criminal case. So must all three be acquitted, despite the fact that all three intended to kill or seriously wound someone? Surely all three can be convicted of MPC reckless endangerment if that offense has been enacted in the state of New York, as well as other lesser offenses almost certain to be on the books. The highest court of appeals in New York is unsatisfied with that outcome and stretches to find a ground for affirming the murder convictions of all three. It can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt that some one of the three fired the fatal bullet, Aren't all three accessories, if none can be proved to be the absolute perpetrator? Yes, if a reasonable jury could find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that each had the purpose of getting the others to shoot at him. The court writes, The fact that the defendants set out to injure or kill one another does not rationally preclude a finding that they intentionally aid each other to engage in the mutual combat that caused the victim's death. Normally, one person shoots at another in order to get that other person to stop threatening him or shooting him, not with the purpose of getting the other to shoot back. But the court says that a reasonable jury could still find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that each was shooting at the others for the purpose of getting the others to shoot back at him. Uh -huh. Well, one reads of suicide by cop, so maybe suicide by thug is a thing too? How likely is that? The court helpfully inserts People versus Abbott provides an apt illustration. People versus Abbott is a drag racing case, not an HRA sanctioned. It had a fatal outcome, and the surviving drivers were charged and convicted of manslaughter. To remind you of the rules, Defendant Abbott drove recklessly for the purpose of getting his co-defendant Moon to drive recklessly too. Moon was the absolute perpetrator of the homicide, but a reasonable jury could find beyond a reasonable doubt that Abbott's purpose was to encourage Moon to race, that is, to drive as fast as he could. Now, the analogy may strike you as a bit odd. Of course, drag racers purposely encourage each other to race, but shooters don't normally encourage others to shoot back. Nevertheless, the state of New York will have its murder convictions. The Abbott analogy might unsettle us. If Abbott, the other driver, is liable for manslaughter, what about the spectators? We'll come back to that issue. But first, we need to consider another way in which some courts have stretched doctrine 
in order to affirm convictions of accessories. In the California case of People v. Luparello, the defendant was convicted of first-degree murder. Luparello was absent when the victim was fatally shot by the absolute perpetrator. The shooter was one of several friends Luparello had recruited to help him locate Terry, Luparello's ex-wife. Martin, the victim, was thought to know where Luparello might find him. Luparello told his friends he wanted that information at any cost. Luparello, with his friends, failed to get Martin to disclose Terry's whereabouts. His friends, without Luparello, returned to Martin's residence the following night. Martin was lured outside and shot from ambush. Under the Peone Doctrine and the MPC, convicting Luparello would require proof that he purposely encouraged the shooter's conduct and, because homicide is a result crime, acted with the culpability needed to convict the shooter of murder in the first degree. That sets a bar that the evidence seems not to meet. Luparello's purpose was to locate Terry, and a dead Martin could not help him with that. Nevertheless, the Luparello court affirms on the ground that an aider or a better is guilty not only of the offense he intended to facilitate or encourage, but also of any reasonably foreseeable offense committed by the person he aids and abets. And a reasonable jury could find beyond a reasonable doubt that Luparello acted negligently with respect to the result. But mere negligence, even gross negligence, would not suffice to convict the shooter of murder. Luparello goes way beyond Fountain, the Seventh Circuit case that lowers the culpability bar from purpose to knowing substantial facilitation for the most serious offenses. There is no evidence that Luparello knew that his friend was going to kill Martin. Yet Luparello's conviction is upheld for the reason that, in the court's words, aiders and abettors should be responsible for criminal harms they have naturally, probably, and foreseeably put in motion. This observation confuses the question whether Luparello should be held criminally responsible with the entirely distinct question of what offense he has committed. If by his own act of grossly negligent gun handling, Luparello had caused Martin's death, he would be convictable of MPC criminally negligent homicide at most. Despite its departure from sound principle, Luparello has been influential.